Hello everybody, I'm Dr Kelly Teagle from Wellfem and thanks for joining us for this webinar on mental health and menopause. Now you can see uh, the talking head next to me is my friend Hilary Sargent who's a very experienced psychologist here in Canberra and she's uh, agreed to come on today and share her wisdom with us about the subject of, um, of why we all go, seem to go a bit nuts around perimenopause. So thanks for joining us Hilary. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, so as always, I need to let you all know that um, this is for informational purposes only. So you always should seek individual medical advice and psychological advice for your own circumstances. And um, I think we can just launch right into it, really. Oh, and the other thing to tell you all is that uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box at any stage during the evening. And then at the end, once Hilary and I have done our presentations, we'll go through your questions one by one and hopefully we'll be able to get to everybody's questions. And hello, Sherelle, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna launch right in. You can see our slideshow down the bottom there. So this evening I'm going to speak first and then Hilary's going to talk and I'm going to talk about how common mental health issues are around menopause, um, what the causes and risk factors are and what the medical treatments are. And then Hilary's going to tell us a bit about recognition of anxiety and depression and what other treatments are available besides the medical ones and where you can get help for those. And then we'll go on to our Q&A. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so how common are mental health issues around menopause? Well, the answer is very common. Um, in fact, uh, at, at perimenopause, you're about three times as likely to be suffering from a mental health issue as at all of the preceding times. In fact, um, Australian statistics show that the highest suicide rates for females are actually in the 45 to 55 year old age group. So that tells us a lot about the severity of the depression that women are experiencing during those years, which is quite disturbing. Um, also, the Australian Bureau of Statistics back in 2007 was saying that 43% of women aged 18 to 65 had had a mental health problem at some time during their life. And apparently the estimated cost of anxiety and depression um, to society in an economical sense has been as estimated as being as high as $22 billion a year, which is just crazy. So there's a whole lot of lost productivity around these mental health conditions as well. Okay, so what's, what are the causes of mental health issues around menopause? And a biggie obviously is hormones. Um, you know, we're all aware that our hormones change during the perimenopausal years, um, but it doesn't just happen in a nice, gentle, linear, slope-wise fashion. And, and the, uh, the, the actual symptoms that we get aren't so much related to the absolute levels of reproductive hormones as they are to do with the the rate of change of those hormones, so the decline and the fluctuations in the hormones. Um, so at perimenopause, which is the premenopausal transitionary stages and early postmenopause, it's considered to be a, a window of vulnerability for women for mental health issues, even if they haven't had any previous problems. And as I said, the hormones can fluctuate quite wildly. Now, this eminent professor of psychiatry um, in, a, in an interview said um, to think of estrogen as being having a good hormone effect on the brain, whereas progesterone tends to have a bad impact mentally on the brain. Um, so I think that's a very simplified way of talking about it. But what it means, and you may have noticed this yourself, is that um, at times in your cycle when estrogen is actually quite high, you tend to have the best mood and also be functioning better in your verbal memory, which is your talking skills. Um, and that tends to be the first half of the cycle right up to mid-cycle. And then you may have noticed that at times in your cycle when your progesterone is higher, you tend to have the lowest mood or, and uh, that tends to be premenstrually. Now in about 4% of women, this can actually be so severe as to be diagnosed as premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And that uh, urgently requires treatment that can be quite significant. All right, so what are the risk factors for health issues around menopause? Okay, so 
as you probably would understand, if, it, if somebody's had a prior mental, uh, mental health history, like perinatal depression or pre-existing anxiety, then they are going to be much more likely to experience some kind of anxiety and depression um, around perimenopause as well. But it can actually appear for the first time in women who haven't had any prior history. Um, but as far as risk factors go, people suffering from other health issues, so if they're in poor health or they have chronic diseases, chronic pain, um, if they've got prior, prior premenstrual complaints, um, if they've shown a vulnerability to depression in the past, also psychosocial factors such as if they have negative attitudes towards aging, um, if, they, if they feel hassled, if they're undergoing stressful life, life events, uh, if they're unemployed, they've got a lack of social supports. So all of these things contribute, you know, all of us are very much a product of everything that's going on in our lives, all the environmental factors, our relationships, our stresses. Um, so it's not just one thing in isolation. So the hormones alone aren't fully responsible generally. Um, I can't get rid of my little box that's in the way here at the moment. Um, there may also be a higher risk of depression for people who have a surgical or an early menopause as well. Um, and, um, and people, the, the relationships in women's lives can be important too. So um, if they're caring for elderly parents or going through stressful times with teenagers, grieving over an empty nest, those sorts of things are important. Um, and oh yeah, and I missed that one there about um, the higher number of troubling symptoms. So if you're ha having disturbed sleep because of your hot flushes, that's obviously going to have a negative impact. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different medical treatments for depression and anxiety. The obvious one that everyone's heard about, and often there's a lot of stigma related to, is antidepressant medication. Um, but it actually can be very, very effective, and in some women it's absolutely life-changing. So uh, the important thing to realise is that when you start on antidepressant medication, the results generally aren't instantaneous. It usually takes four to six weeks to get the full effect, um, although you can notice some small changes as early as two weeks. And uh, it is indicated for chronic chronic, moderate and severe, so, you know, sort of moderate to severe depression, but generally not that effective for just mild depression. Uh, importantly, at perimenopause and menopause, one of the important effects of some antidepressants is that it can also actually help with hot flushes. So if you're suffering from some hot flushes and you've got a significant mood disorder, it can actually be quite useful to be treating with antidepressants because you can get up to a 50% reduction in hot flushes as well. Um, and it needs to be said also that antidepressants have a very individualised effect. So uh, a particular woman might find that a certain one is much more effective for her than another type or that she'll experience side effects on one type but not another. So, um, you know, you may have to do a bit of trial and error. Don't be too disheartened if, it, if the first one you try doesn't work for you or it gives you side effects because you do need to do a little bit of trial and error sometimes to hit the right one. Um, I'd also like to just mention about uh, estrogen treatment because uh, whilst some women who don't even have hot flushes will even try estrogen therapy for them uh, if they've got significant mood symptoms at perimenopause because sometimes just that stabilising of the hormones can also have a mood stabilising effect as well. But this is considered to be an off-label use. It's not actually um, approved by the Therapeutic Goods Association um, as, a, as a treatment for mood disorder, but it is a nice little side effect. And so if you happen to be using, um, you know, estrogen therapy, HRT for your hot flushes, you may also notice that there's a mood stabilising benefit. It is a, um, not seen to be effective, however, in postmenopausal women. So you wouldn't go using HRT or estrogen therapy um, just for mood treatment in um, postmenopausal women, the older women. Hormonal contraceptives have also been shown to have some mood regulation, regulation benefit. And I think that they can be particularly helpful if you're getting premenstrual symptoms um, and we can actually stop you from having any ovulation that can help to level out, um, you know, your mood as well. And if you're using antidepressants already, then sometimes using um, the estrogen therapy for the hot flushes can actually have like um, an augmentative effect. They can actually have a, um, a joint benefit. 
Um, it is important to note though that most of the studies we have about using estrogen therapy and its mood effects are based on estrogen only therapy. So it's, uh, it's really not that well studied. We don't know that much about the benefits of combined HRT, which is the estrogen and progestins um, and how they impact on mood. Okay. All right, so I am going to let Hillary have a little chat now, but before I do, I'll tell you a little bit about Hillary. Um, so she's a clinical psychologist with over 15 years of experience and a special interest in women's health, which is one of the reasons why I contacted her for tonight. Um, so Hillary uh, specializes in health issues such as endometriosis, um, painful sex and infertility. So women who are dealing with those sorts of problems, also the perinatal period and management of menopause. Hilary also has a background in psycho-oncology um, and has had many years working uh, for the Cancer Council in Queensland and been working in private practice, including here in Canberra for many years. So thank you very much for joining us, Hilary. I'll let you take control of your slides and talk to your slides now. Okay. Thanks very much for having me, Kelly. And hi, Margarita and Ruby. I appreciate you saying hello. Um, I guess the focus of my presentation today, um, following on from what Kelly's been talking about, is depression and anxiety. But I wanted to acknowledge that there are a lot of different other mental health challenges that women in the menopausal period can experience and might want to seek help for. So mm -hmm. I guess that's just something to consider. Um, also, just thinking about, you know, when would I need to see a psychologist? I guess there's two quite helpful uh, things to think about, and that is um, perhaps the duration of the symptoms you've been experiencing. So has it been going on for two days, two weeks, two months? Um, and then the impact that they're having. So, um, you know, if you're quite worried, but you're able to go to work, get along with everybody, it's not impacting on your life versus you can't get out of bed in the morning or it's, you know, you're fighting with your children or a lot of other things are being impacted. So looking at duration and impact of symptoms is really important. And as we go through the slides, um, you might notice, you might recognize some of these symptoms within yourself. I guess we're sort of talking about the clinical diagnoses of depression and anxiety, but there's also a lot of subclinical um, experience of those things where you might have some symptoms, but perhaps not all of the symptoms to be able to actually be diagnosed with depression or with an anxiety disorder. So um, it's quite complicated. We'll just go through and then if you've got any questions, you can always ask us um, through the presentation. We'll answer them at the end. So it's really important to be able to recognise both anxiety and depression. Sometimes women come to see me and say, I didn't know that I was depressed and it's their GP who sent them along to see me. So having some ideas about what that might look like uh, is quite helpful. So in order for depression to be diagnosed, we're really looking at having one of two main symptoms and that is either uh, having a low mood or feeling depressed or irritable most of the time, if not all of the time, so it's just there constantly, and having a lack of interest or pleasure in things that were usually enjoyed. And this lasts for at least two weeks, if not longer. So there's a lot of other symptoms of depression, um, such as having low motivation, um, a change in activity levels, feeling worthless, um, guilty, thoughts about suicide or death, um, there's also a number of symptoms that can actually overlap with symptoms of menopause. So that can be where it's a bit tricky to tease out, is it sleep disturbance due to menopausal symptoms or is it sleep disturbance due to depression? Um, similarly, uh, having low energy or fatigue, um, a sense of anger or hostility that seems out of character. And then a couple more there, um, having trouble concentrating, uh, experiencing weight or appetite change and changes to self-image. So again, could be depression, could be just part of that menopausal experience. Sometimes it's a bit hard to know. So when you go and see a psychologist for depression, um, different psychologists use a range of different therapies, but I guess what they're really trying to do is help people to change or manage unhelpful thoughts, um, looking at behaviours which maybe can also be altered or ways of interacting with others, which if you're not able to change those might be maintaining depression. So the sorts of things that we would do with, with a woman who was experiencing depression um, might be trying to increase their activity level. So that might be doing more pleasant activities, making sure they're, they're doing something nice each day. Um, a lot of the time with depression, people stop doing any enjoyed activity because they don't enjoy it anymore. So just trying to do something each day. Certainly increasing your physical activity can be a really important part of managing your mental health. The good news for mental health is that you don't actually have to do very much for it to have excellent benefit. So as little as 10 minutes a day has been shown to help with mood. This isn't so good for your overall physical health, but if you're looking at, I guess, just trying to lift your mood, even if you can do a short 10 minute walk, you're doing, that's better than nothing. Um, we're also uh, 
always encouraging people to use their social support. So that might be talking to supportive friends or family, um, learning some relaxation or meditation, being able to be more aware in the present moment rather than stressing about what's coming um, or what, what's happened already. Um, certainly we work with people to reduce their use of alcohol or other substances if needs be. Um, stress management is another area that if you're under a high level of stress, of course, that's going to impact on your depression levels. Um, but that last point there, I guess, really helping with people managing their thinking. What I find with women in menopause uh, in that period often get really stuck in thoughts, ruminating over things, often have very critical thoughts about themselves or think a lot about the past or the future yet to come. So helping manage all of those types of thoughts. Mm. Anxiety, I guess, in a way, can sometimes be a little less clear cut. Um, there are a number of different anxiety disorders, but I guess if we look at some of the general signs and symptoms of an anxiety disorder, um, they could include things like feeling very worried or anxious most of the time, finding it very hard to calm down, feeling overwhelmed or frightened by sudden feelings of intense panic or anxiety, so that might be experiencing panic attacks, um, having recurring thoughts that cause anxiety but may seem silly to others. And often people might talk to me and say, when they say it out loud and they say it sounds so silly, but still has an impact. Um, very commonly people will avoid situations or things which cause anxiety. So that might be social events or crowded places or it might be their workplace. Um, and very specifically with post-traumatic stress disorder, people experience ongoing difficulties such as nightmares or flashback after they've had a traumatic event. Again, looking at sort of more um, general signs of anxiety, it's quite helpful to be able to assess sort of the psychological and the physical symptoms. So these are more general signs of anxiety. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the idea of overthinking or rumination, but often again, when women in the menopausal period will have trouble uh, coping with uncertainty or a worry about making the wrong decision. Um, again, feeling restless or on edge all the time, never able to relax. Now here again, we see some of those physical symptoms that can again overlap. Um, you might also notice the overlap with some of the symptoms of depression too. So it all gets a little bit tangled up and complicated sometimes. Um, so trouble uh, feeling very tired, trouble with sleeping, sweating, irritability, um, muscle tension, um, some of that sort of tummy upset sort of experience as well. So what do we do with someone with anxiety? A lot of it's quite similar in many ways to what we do with depression. So um, again, using therapies to help people learn more about their anxiety. And if you can learn more about it, you can learn to not fear it. Often the problem with anxiety is a fear of the fear. So um, learning to understand what it's what anxiety is and um, can often just reduce the anxiety in and of itself. And again, learning to manage thinking differently. Uh, some of the behavioral strategies Strategies that we might go through with people might include, again, relaxation, meditation or mindfulness. Um, again, helping people increase their physical activity, looking after diet, um, especially reducing caffeine and alcohol, not very popular um, options, but might help with anxiety. Again, if we can, helping with improving sleep, encouraging people to use their social supports. Um, and sometimes um, those old wives tales actually work out to be true. So drinking chamomile tea, perhaps that's something that might also be useful um, in helping manage anxiety. So what do you do if you think that you might need some help with either depression or anxiety symptoms or indeed other mental health challenges? Often the best place to start is just with your GP. So ask for an extended appointment to, to talk through your concerns or make an appointment for a mental health treatment plan so that you're able to go in and see a psychologist. So these treatment plans cover 10 sessions with a psychologist or a clinical psychologist each calendar year and you're able to get a Medicare rebate. So at the moment, because of COVID, we're actually able to do these sessions via um, telehealth, so over the phone or via video conference. Um, it's due to run out in September, but we'll see what the government does. It might keep going for a bit longer yet. Um, if you're not eligible for yeah, <laughs> if you're not eligible for Medicare sessions, or perhaps you've used all your sessions in in a year, or you just prefer not to go through Medicare, um, often private health insurance can cover a portion of the fee. Um, one really important point that I wanted to make tonight was at the moment psychologists everywhere are very very busy. There might actually be several weeks or even months wait to see a psychologist at the moment. So really, the earlier you can see, seek help, the better. Don't wait until you're right at the bottom, because it might be still a while till you're able to actually seek that psychological help. So um, 
as a sort of an adjunct to psychology, can also help to seek out a GP who specialises in managing menopause and is, might be able to um, help with some of those medical management of, of those symptoms. There is a long wait for a psychologist, or if you prefer to just try online, there are interactive free programs that you can use. These are generally based on CBT. Um, uh, Mood Gym, My Compass, Mind Spot are all examples. Um, the the uh, web addresses are there as well. You can just register and then you put yourself through a program. These are general programs, so they're not specific to menopause, but certainly can be very helpful as something you can try in the meantime. Um, if you want general mental health information, Beyond Blue is a very good resource. Um, and then for information specific to the menopause, which including mental health information, we've got some really good tip sheets um, through the Australasian Menopause Society and through Jean Hales. So I would recommend having a look at those if you're looking for some information that you can read and take on board. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, that, no, I found that a really, really helpful overview, um, particularly the stuff about recognising depression, because I think you're absolutely right. And um, the, the, the overlap here is very, very interesting to me because a lot of women will come in in menopause and perimenopause and go, I feel like I'm going mad, you know, like mm -hmm. I just, they don't put the picture together. Um, they just feel like um, it must be mental health related um, or that they that, or that they're going to, you know, they are going mad or they're getting depressed or anxious. There's a lot of compulsive behaviours, um, mm. you know, obsessive compulsive behaviours and things like that too. So being able to sort of be a little bit insightful and sort of um, recognise those things is really, really important, isn't it? Mm, definitely. And I think it's such a, I think you've used that, that term before, the perfect storm, um, mm -hmm. that there's so much, I guess, happening outside of life and then a lot of internal stuff happening and, and then a lot of psychological stuff happening. And it's it's hard to tease out what's being caused by what. And in the end, it's probably a product of all of those things. And so I guess seeking that help to, to get help from the medical side, um, but then also considering the psychological side and whether that sort of extra support, um, mm -hmm. I think everyone could do with having a psychologist. Oh, I'd like to have one. So. <laughs> There's not one person that couldn't benefit from that, I think. Yeah, yeah no, uh, that's really helpful. Um, so we've got a couple of questions started to come through and um, they're really ones I think you'd be able to help us out with, Hilary. So um, one of the ones here was that uh, when I wake at night, my mind starts racing and I can't go back to sleep. What should I do? Um, what, have you, what are your thoughts on that one? So, I mean, I think this is probably one of the, the most common experiences for women. You're woken up hot and sweaty, um, having a hot flash, and then, you know, have to hop up, get changed, go through all that rigmarole, and then lying back in bed and trying to actually get back to sleep. That's when the mind really starts ticking. So I guess one of the things that we would recommend for women is that if you haven't been able to get back to sleep within sort of, you know, 15, 20 minutes even, to hop up out of bed, to not lie in bed for hours trying to get back to sleep. Um, it's, I guess sometimes the body can learn like the bed is a place where we stay awake. So we don't mm -hmm. want it to learn that. Um, no. So hopping up, doing something um, uh, not very stimulating. So you wouldn't want to start watching like your favorite TV show or something like that, but mm -hmm. um, perhaps reading a book, just doing something quietly until you start to feel tired again, and then give it a go, hopping back to bed. Um, sometimes people, it's that racing thoughts that really stops them. And often they'll say to me like they'll fall asleep with the telly on or perhaps listening to an audio book. So that's how they always get to sleep. So it might also be learning some strategies just for the first time you go to sleep so that then if you do wake, you're not reliant on somehow extra sort of stimuli helping you go off to sleep. So that might be then learning some strategies to help managing racing thoughts, which might be using say a mindfulness-based strategy of kind of being able to get get yourself unstuck from thoughts that just keep going, seemingly going and going and going. So um, step one, get out of bed, try and do something else and then go back to sleep and then repeat that if it, if it doesn't um, work, going back to sleep. Yeah. I also recommend for people, especially in Canberra in the cold, um, if you can make a comfy place for yourself if you know you're going to wake up you know have a, a like a, a blanket that when once you've cooled down you can pop the blanket on so that you don't get too cold before you go back to bed so kind of looking after your environment might be part of managing that as well mm. yeah no that's that's really good advice um 
I particularly, I love my Calm app. I'm, I'm, yep. you know, I'm somebody who loves listening to that kind of white noise, that background noise. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten a bit used to using that. And you did mention earlier in your presentation about e-mental health resources. I've actually got quite a good um, link, which I'll share with everybody when I do the blog write-up for this webinar. Um, we'll have a whole list of all these resources. Girls, don't worry about madly writing them down because I'll have all the links in the blog. Um, but but um, one of them is for a really comprehensive guide to all the e-mental health resources, including some apps, um, you know, online courses for anxiety and things like that. And these are things produced by, you know, um, universities and organisations with lots of research basis and evidence to support them. So, yeah. you know, there's lots of stuff out there to experiment with and it's really easy, cheap, accessible, um, you know, if you can't get in to see a psychologist, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, just trying different things until you find something that works for you, like Calm App, you, I get a lot of um, really good feedback about that one. Smiling Mind is another one that is often really useful for people. So yeah, definitely, that's a, a great resource to have and just try things out and see how you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another question's just come in. Uh, Ruby actually has just asked as well, will post-menopause issues you mentioned as well, or just Perry? Um, presenting here to, for dealing with anxiety and depression are pretty much applicable to what perimenopause is the hormonal stuff that's thrown over the top of that. So, um, you know, then treating the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause are very issues. Um, Postmenopausally, interestingly, I believe women's happiness um, you know, that um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and dissatisfaction and unhappiness around perimenopause. Um, the that postmenopausally, people, women report being much, much happier in general. So, mm. um, okay, so do women lose? lose confidence in their work. I am getting more and more anxious and feels like I can't cope anymore. Have you got special advice on that, Hilary Dorr? Yeah, so this is, I guess, a um, something that I encounter quite a lot is women who have perhaps had a difficult experience sometime in their work career and then, um, I guess, again, part of that perfect storm, the issues can really arise. And um, it can be really hard if you see uh, your colleagues, younger colleagues being promoted or, uh, you know, you want to try for a change and then it's hard to get a new job. Um, often women feel that they're overlooked because of their age um, and I believe them. Like that's definitely a, a something that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess once work feels like not a safe space, then uh, it's almost a trauma each time you go. So some, I've had some clients who have if they've been away from work and on leave, been perfectly happy, but their anxiety is very situational. So then upon returning to work, it's very difficult again. So with yeah. those women, I guess it's it's really been trying to get at what is it that's actually caused that anxiety in the first place, perhaps maybe processing some of those difficult experiences that might have happened. Or maybe it's some of that really unhelpful self-talk about, well, I'm too old or I'm, um, you know, I'm no good at it or, um, yeah, I guess just what women say to themselves and so often it's about challenging that and I did have a client recently that we had a beautiful outcome where she came in just like that um, and then ended up being able to, um, I guess, learn some strategies so that her anxiety didn't stop her from doing things and, in fact, applied for a higher level position, um, got it. And like it was, a, I was like a proud mother with, for this um, lady who had been able to sort of conquer that. And she was still anxious, but she, she didn't let her anxiety stop her from trying something new. And she didn't let that negative self-talk stop her from doing that. So it's mm -hmm. definitely possible to learn those strategies to overcome some of those challenges. A lot of the time, it's what we say to ourselves rather than mm. necessarily purely the situation. Yeah, um, I remember you and I had this conversation earlier about that, um, you know, one really positive thing about these mental health issues at midlife is that women uh, are very responsive to treatments, you know, they seem to be very motivated and, um, you know, they they 
want to get better they've got things they want to get on and do and um and you know just by teaching them the right strategies that they do actually seem to improve really really well and respond really well it's just like any other muscle in your body really isn't it it's like you know the brain's very plastic and if you if you start practicing thinking in the positive pathways then the positive pathways become more firmly entrenched rather than the negative ones so it's just yeah. a practice isn't it definitely definitely yep Okay, so we do have some other uh, questions trickling in. Firstly, Desley has asked, is it possible to get a copy of this webinar? Um, absolutely, Desley, you can. Um, so you'll be getting a link sent out to you um, after you know, the link with the video and everything will be on it. And also I'll be producing a blog that'll have the webinar video embedded in it. So you'll be able to share all that stuff with your friend. So just watch out for the emails with the information. Um, I'll be getting the blog out there in the the next week so you'll be able to share it as widely as you like um, okay Daniela asks how often do we see not really depression but just apathy um, and I know in my practice Hillary that's very very common you know women won't come in saying I'm depressed they'll come in saying I'm very I'm just exhausted all the time I haven't got I feel like I can't be bothered doing anything um, you know and I ask them are you doing are you planning enjoyable things and they go oh not really I just can't be bothered you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I guess that's where the tricky part comes in of trying to assess, is it actually depression that needs to be treated or is it some other sort of dissatisfaction with life or something else that's contributing to that apathy? So, yeah, it's it's really tricky and I think it's important that we don't always, um, to use the psychological term, pathologise, I guess, that mm. sort of behaviour, that sometimes life just is a bit crappy and people can react to that. Um, Perhaps I might say then that, again, seeking support, even if you're feeling apathetic, is probably still useful to explore what that apathy is and figure out, is it actually a symptom of depression or is it just life's crappy, I'm tired, I don't, I don't want to be doing these things anymore. Um, yeah. So then you can, I guess, approach it with a, a problem-solving approach of trying to see, well, what are those contributing factors? Are there medical issues that they need to go back and talk to you about, for example? Um, so... Yeah, I guess probably for me, I'm usually getting sent the ladies with depression because I'm a clinical psychologist, but um, it's certainly um, something that's worth exploring. And I think it's important not to always jump to a diagnosis when you see a psychologist. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, this is a process that informally a lot of us do with our girlfriends. If you've got a good mate that you catch up with and you just um, download everything to sometimes that really helps to get it straight in your head and you realize that this apathy this fatigue this exhaustion this you know care this you know can't find a to give you know kind of attitude all comes from you know your miserable relationship or something or the fact that you know you're really dwelling on the fact that your mother's getting older and she's going to die or whatever it is that's under there so talking it through can really help with someone you know yeah that really help to tease them out. Mm. yeah <clears throat> um, so I have got a couple of questions here. Uh, herbal supplements rather than medications. Um, I mean, my response to that is, um, you know, I, I, I mean, my position always when it comes to kind of medications and things is, um, I am by, you know, my by training and by nature, I'll go where this is, and um, that's the way I like to treat my patients because I like to know that whatever they're trying is going to be. So whenever you're looking into um, using some supplements of any kind, uh, number one, make sure it's so ask about the evidence for any um, cause. Um, and number two, it would be nice to, to find some evidence that it can actually be useful. So there are a number of things in the menopause space that, you know, have been shown to show some um, minor benefits, uh, for example, with hot flushes you know you might know about black cohosh for example that has been shown to have some mild benefit in hot flushes and so some of the menopause things that you buy at the health food shop or something will have black cohosh in but what you do have to be careful of is looking up the evidence for possible harms with those as well so you know my position always is sure go out there um, try some things if you would like as long as you can be sure that they're safe and then you know obviously if you're finding that that you're getting any unwanted side effects then make sure you discuss that with your doctor as well but it's always a good idea to let your gp know whatever it is that you're trying um, but it you know to be 
perfectly honest about it. Um, when I looked, uh, one of the documents that Hillary and I are going to be putting up in our resources list for you ladies is guidelines on the treatment of depression at, at perimenopause and menopause. And um, their position in that statement was that really there isn't any any good evidence to recommend any particular complementary or herbal medicines um, to treat depression in the perimenopause. Um, Hilary, have you, do you know of any evidence for any of those things? Well, I saw there was a question about St John's wort. I mean, we mm. know that in more general um, research that St John's wort has been shown to have some effectiveness for mild depression. Mm. Um, so that, I guess, where mild depression is... Um, does is not necessarily um, well. We don't treat it using antidepressants. Um, I think the other it, sort of within the menopausal space. Um, I think that information has changed over time. So ten years ago, I used to recommend um, that people could talk to this thing or that thing with their doctor because at that time the evidence was supportive of it. Now mm. it's been shown to be not effective. So I agree with you. I think that um, if you want to try something to make sure that you talk to your doctor um, and your pharmacist, especially if people have been um, through through um, like a, a early menopause from cancer, for example. Um, so just being really careful about just because it's it says it's natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe to take. So I agree 100% with you. Mm. If you want to try it, you can. Sometimes the placebo effect um, is, is a helpful thing um, but you just don't want to be putting yourself at risk of harm yeah absolutely um, now let me think uh, Jo here has said she's seen some articles in relation to adrenal fatigue in perimenopause contributing to anxiety um, what's your understanding of that diagnosis Hillary adrenal fatigue <laughs> I, I don't have an understanding about this to be honest I, I've seen this these terms I guess and I think it relates to um, Sort of stress hormones and um I've, I've looked it up before when somebody's mentioned it so it's not something that i'm very familiar with um mm -hmm. but yeah. i think that's what it's relating to yeah I, i'm not I, sure I, if it's a medical diagnosis I'm or not if it, sure that it is either to be honest yeah, yeah. I can speak to an endocrinologist myself it's certainly not a medical diagnosis that i'm aware of but um you know it it sort of strikes me that it's in there with the diagnosis of nervous breakdown that our mums and dads used to have you know they have mm. a nervous breakdown or something um certainly though um you know you've got to understand that hormones is not just reproductive hormones it's things like cortisol and all those and and adrenaline and the stress hormones and things like that too which prime your body for fight or flight um so I'm, you know, if you're chronically activated, if you're chronically feeling stressed and anxious, your body's coursing with all of this adrenaline and cortisol continuously, you know, you're bathing in it, um, you know, your body is going to be physically exhausted, I would think, from the effects of um, being primed all the time. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that would be the closest thing I could think of to what adrenal fatigue might actually mean. And I think the diagno the, the treatment of adrenal fatigue is all the things that we're talking about, you know, the things that we need to do to try and um, distract and calm and, you know, uh, just basically treating the underlying anxiety and things so that we can then, you know, reduce the secretion of all of those stress hormones that are going along with that. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've got some comments in here. Ruby says, feeling sad at times, don't know why. Um, absolutely. I think we all do. And I think that the hormones just exacerbate that even more. Um, you know, premenstrually is when, you know, the little things that normally wouldn't make you terribly sad or upset can really hit home and you can find yourself in floods of tears for no apparent reason. So yes, absolutely. It's a thing, Ruby. Absolutely. Um, so Christine said, I'm interested to hear what you think of some of the alternative natural therapies that are around, like happy hormones. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks, Christine, you're right. I just kind of covered off on that, I think, um, with my earlier comments. Um, Carolyn, I'm finding that the very low mood slash energy anxiety and withdrawal from life comes and goes. At what point do you think we should seek help? And is it a case of just trying to ride out the harder months? Hilary, what do you think? So I think this comes back to what I said at the start of my part of the presentation of looking at what the impact of that low mood anxiety withdrawal from life is. 
it affecting you? Uh, it sounds a silly thing to say perhaps, but is it impacting on your ability to work? Is it getting in the way of your family or is it getting in the way of your relationship with friends? Um, and how long is it lasting for? Um, even if it's sort of cyclical and it's every month you seem to experience that, um, you know, there might be some, again, some strategies that you can learn that would help you just sort of ride through those, um, those days. I don't know if I if the, the question there is about writing out the harder months, I think if it's lasting for months, then that's answering the question of seeking some help for that. Um, I guess, again, that sort of two week period is perhaps a useful rule of thumb and it's the one we use with depression symptoms that if it's more than two weeks, then it's depression. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you're having that really low mood, um, low energy, wanting to withdraw and it's lasting for more than two weeks, then perhaps there is some depression at play there. So, yeah, thinking about what impact it's having, how much impact and how long it's lasting for. Um, but it sounds like it might be worth to have a chat to the GP and, and see what, what, which, what's the way forward. Absolutely. Um, now, Lee asks about Livial to affect mood and libido issues. Yes, Lee, absolutely. Um, Livial is... Um, it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's, um, it's not really, um, you're not actually taking estrogen as such, but something that stimulates, selectively stimulates certain estrogen modulators, including ones in the brain. Um, it has been shown in some people to have a mild testosteroneizing effect, which can actually improve libido a little bit for some people as well. Um, it is equivalent of a low dose HRT, I guess. So it's usually only used postmenopausally. Um, so when women have been at least 12 months without a period, um, and for women who are only kind of needing a more modest effect in terms of their symptoms like hot flushes. But yes, it can have a mood stabilizing effect and it can have um, a mild benefit to libido for some people as well. Um, along similar lines, we've got a question here about libido, about the fact that, um, you know, sex drive is quite low and that um, she can't take HRT. I would recommend highly um, just having a look at our blog and webinar from last month, which was the talk about intimacy at menopause. And we talked about low libido and vaginal dryness and um, all manner of things with my friend Marita O'Shea, who's a pelvic floor physiotherapist. So um, definitely there's a lot of good information about um, how to approach low libido and things like that in, in last month's webinar. So just hop on the website to the blog section and have a look. Um, let me have another look. What do we got here? Somebody mentions being a bit scared of breast cancer and HRT. Very common fear, Ruby. Um, absolutely. And there's loads of things that we can do that are safe for, for post breast cancer patients. So um, definitely speak to an expert in, in menopause treatments to find out about those. Um, Stephanie, we're sort of getting away from the mood things so much here, but um, Stephanie asks about she's got a hysterectomy. How do I know through if I've gone through menopause? Um, that's a tough one, but um, you know it may not really be relevant because if you're not having periods, yeehaw, fantastic! Um, and if you're having symptoms, we treat them. So you know it's not really that big of an issue to know for sure one way or the other. But if you were super young, um, I would be wanting to test your hormones just to make sure because if you're going for too long you know much under the age of 50 without much estrogen on board it will definitely affect your bones and heart disease risk but um, otherwise just enjoy not having periods Stephanie um, is constant nausea a symptom of postmenopause uh, I don't it's not one of the more commoner ones I have to say so uh, definitely if you have menopausal symptoms get those treated but um, if the nausea still exists you need that further investigated by your GP for sure. Hilary how do you find a good psychologist? Yes I just saw that question pop up thanks Lee. Um, this is a really good question because one psychologist is not a sort of one size fits all. Um, there's going to be um, people that click together and then others not so much. And so I think um, finding a, a good psychologist, first of all, might depend a little bit on what you're actually needing some help with. If it's something that's a little bit more obscure, I guess, um, being perhaps um, talking to your GP, often GPs will have a good relationship with psychologists or they'll know which ones that their patients come back and say, oh yeah, I saw so-and-so and they were really good. Mm -hmm. So GP is where you get your referral from anyway. So they're often a good place um, to, to find 
a good person. Um, speaking to friends, if you've got anybody who's seen a psychologist asking for recommendations. Um, the Australian Psychological Society mm -hmm. has got a service which is called a Find a Psychologist service that you can type in and find people. Uh, not all psychologists are registered with that, but you might be able to click on, you know, if you want someone who's specialist in cancer or specialist in women's health issues, then you might be able to click on there and find somebody. Um, but really, I think it is important to not, uh, if you see somebody and you feel like you don't click with them, you should feel really comfortable from that very first session. If you don't walk away thinking, I'd like to see her or him again, then it's probably worth getting some other recommendations, trying somebody else. Um, sometimes clients tell me, you know, their husband's seen someone for six sessions. I don't think he does anything. My husband doesn't really like him, but he just keeps going. And I hate hearing stories like that because I think it's really important that you find someone that you're comfortable with that seems to know what they're talking about um, that you can really talk to and learn some of these strategies from. So, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. It is very tricky, but I feel I feel like any one of our ladies would be very comfortable talking to you. I know I would. <laughs> You've had some oh, thanks, really Kelly. good advice for everyone tonight. We might call it there because we've been going for 45 minutes and um, we don't want to give everyone um, screen fatigue or anything like that. We'll go off and, um, and have some dinner and a glass of water now, I think, to recover. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, Hilary, and for giving us all of that great information. Um, some, there was a suggestion just at the end there about um, any links between perimenopause and food intolerances or gut issues. Um, Louisa, I will record that down as a possible future topic for one of our webinars down track. But um, thank you again, everyone, for coming and Hilary for being a part of this. I think you're an absolute natural at doing webinars. You should do that oh. often. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> okay. So, yes, um, thank you, everybody, and good night.